let's declare the goodness and the greatness of our God this morning. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and you break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God, you do great things. Oh, hero. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, you're unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great. we worship you here this morning not only do you do great things but you are great God remind us in these next few moments moments of just just how good you are father I searched the world but he couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing 
Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Better than you are. 
there's nothing Oh, nothing is better than you Father, we declare that this morning That there is nothing that is better than you There's nothing that is greater than you We speak out the truth We speak out the truth this morning I love those kinds of songs that are written that remind us that if we came in this morning with a bunch of a heap of ashes that he can turn it all into beauty we can trade our shame for his glory because he's just that good I don't know what you came in with this morning I don't know what anxious thoughts you have this morning Or maybe you came in and you're just on cloud nine this morning. I'm sure from one one swing of the pendulum to the other, there's probably everything in between here in the room. But one thing that is the same, one thing that is constant is our Jesus. That we can place our trust in him. That he is the giver of life. That whatever is dead in your life, that he can breathe life on it. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's a financial struggle, whether it's a health issue. He has the ability to breathe life on it. And what can seem like a valley of just dry bones disconnected, when he breathes, it all comes together because of the power of who our God is. I don't know if there's anybody else in this room this morning that's believing for something that humanly possible you can't do and no one else can do, but I am. Is there anybody else in this room that's believing for a miracle? All over the place. Can I remind you that your God is the miracle working God? But even if you don't get to see the miracle, even if I don't get to see the miracle that I'm believing for, I will still stand here every day and I will choose to exalt the name of Jesus because he is good. I choose to exercise faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they said, we're gonna go into the fiery furnace, and we're believing God that you're gonna go with us, and that there's gonna be a miracle, but even if you don't, I wanna call out an even if you don't faith today, that you would still stand, arms held high, head held high, focused on the only one who can bring a miracle and believing that whether it's on this side of heaven or the other side that it will come to pass come to pass because there is nothing that is impossible for our God so this morning as we sing this next song for those of you the tons of people who raised their hands and said I'm believing for a miracle I want to challenge you this morning to sing this song to your great God who gives life, who is love, who brings peace, but you would give everything of yourself this morning and lay everything else aside and go after the one who has given you life and has given you the ability to stand and to sing and to worship him today. Because you give life, you are love, You bring light to the darkness You give hope and you restore Every heart that is broken Cause great are you, Lord Sing that again, you give life You give life You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, and 
you restore every heart that is broken yes. great are you Lord it's your breath in us Pour it out before a good God this morning. He gave it to you anyway. To you only. In great See, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you It's your breath 
our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out great, great God, Father. And we elevate our faith and we elevate our praise here today because of who you are. We look to you, Father, for all of our needs. You are the great I am. That's what you said in your word. You're the great I am. And that means for whatever I need, that is who you are. So if I'm needing peace today, you are the Prince of Peace. If I'm needing strength today, you are my strong tower. If I'm needing a father today, you are Abba Father whatever I'm needing today, I look to you, my source, my sustainer, my redeemer, my provider. It's all about you. I don't look to anything else. I can only be satisfied in you. I thank you, Father. I thank you that your word is true, that you say that when we lift up our praise to you, that you inhabit the praise of your people. So I thank you, Father, that you are here in our midst. Your word says that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are right in the midst. So I thank you, Jesus, that you are here in this room. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're going to do in this place today, what you're going to do in hearts, how we're going to grow, we're going to expand, we're going to be more like you when we walk out of these doors today because of, of your presence, because of your word because we chose to come here to this place to be refreshed, to be restored, to be renewed so that we can go back out and face the world with Jesus on. We put Jesus on today and we thank you for what you're gonna do in this place in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people in this place said, Amen. Amen before you take a seat this morning, why don't you just simply turn around to somebody maybe you don't know and tell them welcome to the Father's house. Good morning. It is such a blessing. To have a mute switch? Am I good? I don't know. Am I good? Let me see. It's on. It's on? Is my voice just, oh, we're good. Okay. It's such a blessing uh, to be here at the Father's house. And uh, it's also good to have a target and a mission. So let's say it together. Absolutely. We are bringing Bringing hope hope and impacting our community by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. On the seat back in front of you, you will notice a connection card. It has two QR codes, one to join the Wi-Fi and the other is a digital guide. At the very bottom, it says, how can we help you? 
feel free to write down any prayer requests or praise reports right there. And you can also utilize the back as well. If you are new to the Father's house, we want to welcome you. And we have a gift for you. Just fill out the connection card with as much information as you feel comfortable and take it to the new here, start here table. Yeah, speaking of new here, start here. If you're new, we have a lot of things going on. And the best way to keep up with that is thefathershouse.com. So much that's happening, so many things that do go on on a week-to-week basis. Um, like yesterday, we had the Martin Luther King Parade. How many of you got to go out and enjoy that, riding or walking? Yeah, pretty good stuff. So those types of things we're going to have there. But um, one other really cool thing is we've got life groups coming up. Yeah. Life Group Signups starts now, today. You can start today. Go to thefathershouse.com. I know it says the 29th, but you guys can start early if you want. Go to the webpage. Check it out. We've got a table out in the lobby this morning that you can go and check out to get signed up. And, and there's so much fun. Yes, they are. My brother, part- Eddie, yeah. and I, we're in a life group together. Yes, we and are. It's about relationships. And, and just real quick, one of my good friends, uh, Miss Lewis, passed away, and Yesterday, I spoke at her funeral, and, you know, she kind of knew that um, she was going to pass away, and she left me this book, and it's called Prayers uh, for Difficult Times for Men, and I just think that relationships are so important, and, and because you just never know, and you want to make sure that you are focused in and on that particular goal. Absolutely. Exactly. Relationships bring us together yeah. and it form a bond of community that you'll never have anywhere else. That's right. Because the church is what's that, that's what it's all about, right, Thurman? That's right. And here at the Father's House, we, we love to give. And we live to give. So that's the one we do. Um, we give, and you guys are so generous, we're able to give back to the community, we're able to give to missions, not just here in the States, but across the world. And if you're giving this morning, online church, welcome. Check it out online at thefathershouse.com slash give or text giving to 352-329-2301. You can do that if you're in the house as well. But we do have the giving envelopes right there in the seat back pocket in front of you. It says give. It is postage paid. So if you weren't prepared this morning, go ahead and take that with you. Drop it in the mail this week with your check or the uh, debit or credit card information that you can write down there. And as we have the ushers come through, check out these videos. So Pastor Tim, why should I come to the Freedom Encounter on a Saturday? On a Saturday too, right, I get that because it is a great half a day experience. We're gonna have God's spoken word over us, great worship. And then together we are gonna declare the power of God to break things in our life like worry, fear, pride, anxiety, all these different things that keep us from having God's just best for us. So, you gotta come. Where are you gonna have snacks? We're gonna have snacks, grab and go breakfast in the morning, snacks at the break. It's gonna be a fantastic day. Please don't miss it and tell us how we can register. Well, to register, you can text the word ENCOUNTER to 352-329-2301. It is Saturday, January 28th. Doors open at 8.30. The conference starts at 9. I already registered. Did you? Of course I did. Awesome. We realize our homeless feeding and drug rehabilitation programs don't always match eye to eye with the dreams and vision of the city planners here in Leesburg. But we believe they are closely aligned with the heart and mind of God. Our county has the highest unemployment rate in this state. We know this isn't an end-all solution, but it is a big step in the right direction. That is all. Everything you've been through, God custom made you for this. Awesome. What a great morning. It's so good to see you. If I haven't told you lately, let me tell you, I love you. 
I wouldn't want to do life without you. Man, it would be real boring if I was just by myself today. I think uh, you guys hit it right when you said we were created for relationships. Hey, we're in a series called I Love My Church. And this is, I think, what, uh, third night, third Sunday in this. And today we're going to talk about doing life together. How many of you remember the old sitcom Gilligan's Island? Wow, look at the hands. I know some of you are t- so young, you probably watched it on reruns, right? Or Nick at Night. You wouldn't remember it. But remember, uh, Skipper and Gilligan, they took five passengers supposedly on a three-hour tour that ended up being a three-year sitcom with 98 episodes. Uh, the premise, if you've never, if you never watched it or you don't remember, is that uh, on the little chartered boat, they left Honolulu, and they were going out for a three-hour cruise, and a storm came, and they crashed on an uncharted island, and they were there for three years. What you saw were people of different age groups, different backgrounds, stuck on an island, waiting to get rescued. And they were learning to do life together. Isn't that a picture of the church? Here we are stuck on this island called the world. And we're waiting for one day in what the Lord is going to come back and rescue us. But in the meantime, we must learn to integrate our life with others and do life together. Do you understand that? So in this series, we're talking about I love my church. Looks great to see all those t-shirts. I walked by a while ago and saw all the t-shirts here and people are wearing them around town at the gym and different places. Great witnessing tool. And so we said, we love our church because Christ loved the church. Ephesians 5 and 25 says, Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for the church. So Jesus loved the church, therefore we should love the church, and he gives us the ability to love the church. Uh, One of the things I would like to remind those of you who serve, how many of you serve somewhere on this campus at least once a month? Would you raise your hand? I just want to say thank you, because this church wouldn't be who we are without you. I heard, I met yesterday uh, uh, someone who's been attending for like three months, and they said, you know, we love your church, and what we love about your church is that it seems like that everybody likes everybody that comes to church. Wow, I thought, boy, that's great. Isn't that that a great thought? So Tuesday night, I know you've already got an email because you're serving somewhere at the Father's house, and it's team night. Team night is on Tuesday this week in which I'm going to share some principles with you. We have a great little meal together, and I'm going to share with you some new things that's upcoming that I'm going to share with you first because you have a place of serving in this church. So if you haven't signed up, tonight at midnight, it's cut off. And you'll become a munchkin if you serve and you don't show up, all right? So you can text TEAM to 352-329-2301 or go to fathershouse.com. Do it now. Do it today before you forget it. Let's pray. Father, as we come today, um, still in this series, I Love My Church, we thank you, Lord, that you've called us to love your church because you, we, we follow your pattern. We're baptized in water because we're following your pattern. And so, Lord, we're following the pattern to say that we love, we love our church. And so I pray today that you will anoint me. I have words, but they're just empty words without your anointing. So I pray today that you'll give us understanding and revelation. Help me to say what you want me to say. Don't let me to say anything I shouldn't say. And Lord, we pray if there's one person here today, if there's one person here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, we anticipate at the end of the day when we give that opportunity, Lord, they'll surrender their heart to you. In your name we pray, amen. So in this series, I Love My Church, we said, first of all, we realize that I love my church by living on mission. Say, living on mission. Living on mission. So we talked a couple of weeks about the mission that Christ has given the church. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Go into all the world and make disciples, right? And then last week we looked at this powerful verse, Matthew 24, verse 14. Read it out loud with me. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. 
We said last week there are some maybe 16,000 different people groups, and uh, we want to do our part in reaching them. So I shared with you last week this app. I hope that you downloaded it from the Joshua Project, and it just simply is the unreached of the day. How many of you downloaded that, all right? How many of you incorporated that into your prayer life this week? Three. Yet we want the Lord to come back, right? But he says, I'm not coming back until this gospel is into all the world. And so we gave you a little tool last week. You just simply go to the app place, go to the Joshua Project, and there you'll see this little thing, Unreached of the Day. And all week long, we've been pulling up the Unreached of the Day and praying for them. And today is the uh, Hongshu uh, a people. There are 350,000 of them, only 2.5% are Christians. Early this morning when I started praying for them, there was like 300 people praying. Already today, 928. Folks, we need to pray that God would give us the opportunity to reach people <coughs> and that we could reach people around the world. We say, here's our, our mission. This is our mission. We said it just a minute ago, and this is what the Father says is all about. Say it with me. We are bringing hope and impacting our community by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. So Jesus left the mandate for the church to go make disciples, live on mission. And then also, we're going to love our church by doing life together. Say, doing life together. So I, I, I guess people say, we, we say, you know, you need to do life together. You need to do life together by attending church on the weekend, do life together by being part of a small group. But then I think we need to go back and look at the why. Why are we to do that? I mean, just, we just take it for granted. Well, we come to church, and, but why is the why behind that? Why did you come this morning? Why have you signed up for a small group? I think it's so critical for us to understand the why behind the what. And what's the principle behind doing life together? Why should we do life together? Well, the church is Jesus's idea. And Jesus not only says, I want to give you a mission to go into all the world, I want you to do your best to share the good news with people, bring hope to people. But then he says, but I don't want you to do it alone. I want you to integrate your life with other believers that are serving on purpose. It's this word that we hear a lot about in church called fellowship, you know, fellowship. Fellowship is not that we get together for another meal, right? I mean, it used to be, we're going to have a fellowship dinner. So we all get together, we bring, you know, potluck and you hope it's good and we come together. No, fellowship is much more than that. It's the Greek word kononia. It occurs 19 times in the New Testament and the principle of fellowship or kononia is seen in the words, read it with me, community, partnership, and participation. So Jesus created for us to be in fellowship with other believers. So, so then I would ask myself, well, what's the foundational principle for doing life together? Genesis 2 and 18, look at this. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. When you study this phrase, the Hebrew constructive reads like this, not good, not good is man alone. Not good, not good is man alone. Can you say that with me? Not good, not good is man alone. This is the first time God said anything in the word that we read that it's not good. Remember, he says he created the sun, he created the moon, he created all, and he says, oh, this is good. But this day he says, hmm, it's not good that man would be alone. And so what did he do? God created this beautiful person called Eve. And when Adam first saw her standing there beautiful, he said, whoa, man. I'm sure you wondered where that word ever came from, right? God said, I want to fix the problem. It's not good for man to be alone. Here's what we need to understand. 
This is what some of you, your, your whole life, you, you've been struggling with this. We are wired, we are built, we are created by God and wired for companionship. There is a spiritual element to doing life together. It's fellowship. We are created to do life together. Dr. Leonard Kamer, a well-known psychiatrist for 30 years, specializing in treating depression. Here's what he says. The human being is the only species that can't survive alone. Human beings need other human beings. Did you, did you hear that? Did you understand that? We can't survive alone. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, I'd just like a week of being alone. That would really help me. But I'm going to tell you, that would grow short. We are created. We are, you will never achieve your maximum potential unless you're in a relationship, fellowship with other believers. Proverbs 18, verse 1 and 2, wisest man ever lived, said this, verse 24. A man who isolates himself. Say isolates. You ever met somebody who isolates himself? You hear those stories about people who lock themselves away. They're multimillionaires, but they don't spend any money. And, and they're just locked away and how miserable their life ends. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. A man who has friends must himself be what? Friendly. Look at your neighbor and smile at him. Say, just in case you wonder, I'm friendly. Why are you frowning at me? All right. Maybe you should look at the other side and tell that person I'm friendly. You might want to go home with them. No, not really if you're married. Look at that. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than the brother. He said, look at that. A man who isolates himself rages against wise judgment. And I know, I, 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 would, I, I ask myself, what causes people to isolate themselves? I don't, I, I don't want to be involved with anybody else. I just want to come to church. I want to sit, you know, for 10, 20 years. I don't want anybody to speak to me. I'm going to come late and leave early. I, I don't want that. Don't ask me about volunteering. Don't ask me to do anything. I just want to live my life by myself. I don't want to be bothered with people. Why would, why would someone feel that way? Well, I think sometimes it's because of events in our life have almost made us want to be isolated from other people. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been rejected. Maybe there's a physical ailment. Maybe there's painful relationships in your history. And so what do we do? We say, I will never be vulnerable again. And so what do we do? We build walls. We build walls to protect ourselves, to keep us safe. But when we build walls to isolate ourselves, we rage against all wisdom and judgment. Because I'm not created to live behind walls isolated. There's a really interesting book that if you're interested in World War history, World War II, it's called Inside the Third Reich. It's written by Hitler's closest associate, Albert Speer. Albert Speer was the architect behind most of what Hitler did. In the Nuremberg trials, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. And there he wrote the book Inside the Third Reich. Supposedly, he was Hitler's closest friend, if Hitler had a friend. In fact, in the book, Inside the Third Reich, he talks about that Hitler repelled against human interaction. In other words, Hitler had no relationships really with anyone. The closest one would have been Albert. And then Albert says, that's very iffy. 
And so, because so, sometimes we wonder, why could Hitler do what he did? How was he that way? Because he built these walls to isolate himself and had no idea what was going on around him. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not be a Hitler, but I'm telling you, there's pain in your life, difficulty in your life. When you build walls and say, I will never let anybody come beyond the wall, I will never be hurt again. You were built for Konania, you were built for relationship. In our prison system, we have solitary confinement. And it solitary confinement was built, if I remember right, Jimmy, you can help me with this. Solitary confinement was built to break people, break people. But you know what they've discovered? Solitary confinement never helps a person, never improves a person, but only makes them worse. Solitary confinement. The principle is this, it's not good to be alone. You see, you can be sitting here this morning in this this crowd, people all around you, but you feel isolated, You you feel alone, you feel like that maybe there's something missing in your life. So the first question is, why? What's the principle behind this? It's just that it's not good for man to be alone. We're never created to do life by ourselves. The second pattern we see in this is we understand the principle, but what's the pattern behind this? How is the church supposed to work? The church is not a country club. We don't set up and say, well, I think we should do this or I think we should do that. Remember, I said the mission of the church A local church can never come up and say, well, what's our mission? Our mission should be to feed the poor. Our mission should be to clothe people. Our mission should be this, our mission. No, Jesus said, here's the mission. I want you to go into all the world and I want you to take the good news because once you do that, I'm coming back. That's our mission. And the second thing is, he says, here's how I want you to live together in the church. And he gives us a picture of that in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. It's rather lengthy. You can follow along in your Bible or you can look at the Sky Bible. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be safe from this perverse generation. Verse 41, that's where I want you to pick up. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They, con- they continued steadfastly or ongoing in two things. What? The apostles' doctrine and then in fellowship. Say apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So they got together to hear the apostles' teaching. And they got together in small groups in Fellowship, Konania. Look at that. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. In other words, there were no people who said, I'm not going. I'm not going to house. I'm not going to go to small groups. I'm not going to follow into that. No, it says all, all. And I looked at the Greek and guess what? It means all. (laughs) So if you're not in a fellowship group with other believers, you're not following the pattern of the New Testament. Because I think sometimes when we talk about small groups or fellowship groups, we think, oh yeah, but that's for people that are extroverts. I don't want to go into somebody's home. I don't want somebody in my home. I just, I just sort of do life alone. Okay, but the pattern is they kept focus on, as we do the weekends, with the teachings, and then during the week in small groups, in house to house, breaking bread. And they had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided among them as many as they needed. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, 
They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Maybe if your life is complicated and you're getting indigestion, it's because you're not living according to God's pattern, okay? Just, sorry, I just couldn't get away from that. Verse 47, would you read it out loud with me? Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I want you to think about this. The the church was very impactful in those early days, in the first 25 years. Look at this. In Acts 2, there were how many in the upper room waiting and praying? 120, right? And Peter preaches, and on that day, there's 3,000 that are added to the church. So now there's 3,120 people in the church. How are you going to take care of people like that? And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, you can just jot these down and look at them later. Acts 2, verse 47, it says that they were daily added to the church. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, it says that there were 5,000 men in the church plus women and kids. So multiply that. So that means that at that time, there was maybe 10 to 15,000 people that were in the church. And then in chapter 5, verse 14, there were multitudes. And then in chapter 6, verse 7, it says that no longer are they being added, but now it's multiplication. And then in Acts 21 and verse 20, when Paul returns to Jerusalem, here's what the elders inform Paul. Acts 21 and 20. How many tens of thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? Tens of thousand. Church growth experts share that within the first 25 years of the church, the church grew from the 120 to some 60,000 to 100,000 in the city of Jerusalem alone. Now, if you're an a thinker, you're thinking, okay, how big was Jerusalem? At that particular time, 25 years later, Jerusalem had 250,000 people. So think about it. The church was some maybe 100,000 strong, and there were 250,000. So was the church making a difference in their community? Was the church doing something different? So you say, well, how in the world? How in the world? I understand how they could meet from house to house. But how in the world, where did that many people meet? Well, here's what the scripture says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Look at this. Day after day in the temple, what? It doesn't say in temple court. It says in the temple courts. And from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news, Jesus is the Messiah. You say, wow. You see, the temple at this time would be 45 acres big. So you see, sometimes we think, well, here we are. What do we have here? Seven acres that we have on on here. But you got to think the temple at that time in Jerusalem, 45 acres. And there were many courtyards around the temple. Courtyards, not one. So anyone could come into the outer courtyard. It was a place where there was instruction and inspiration and thousands of people could get together. But that wasn't the only thing they did. Then they broke off in small groups. You see, it's sort of like this. They met in large groups where the apostle has something to say. Then they met in small groups where you have something to say and we want to hear it because it's important. Do you see that? It wasn't just either or, but it was all of those together. So as we look at that, we say, okay, there's two principles. The weekend meeting that we have here, whenever that is, a Saturday night or Sunday morning, Sunday evening, whatever we do, we have that. But then it's what we call life groups, life groups. And we have the brochure. You've got the brochure. It says, uh, start the year off right with life groups. Um, and we've got all kinds of life groups in here for you to sign up for. At the end of the service, you can go out in the foyer and there'll be some people there to help you sign up. You can do uh, registration. You can click that little QR code and you can register yourself. You, you can be that. You can do part of that. But as we move into this year, you don't want to just do, you don't want to just do church halfway. 
You don't want to just do church on attending on Sunday morning and just sitting back and listening to what I have to say or Tim or Andrea or Anita or someone else, but you want to follow up with other people and say, let's talk about this. And I know sometimes people say, well, you know, I've just, I I was in a life group once and I'll never do that again. Look, we talked about that the other week. You've been to restaurants that are bad, but by looking around today, I see none of us quit eating. (laughs) Told you I love coffee the first week, but I've had some bad, bad coffee, but I still had a nice cup of hot coffee this morning. We design our life groups in semester basis, which just simply means this. You can sign up, and if those people are not right for you, you can say, one day, I won't be in this life group anymore. Don't quit. Don't quit. Just hang in there. You say, but it's, it's so inconvenient. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Where have we got to the place that we think life shouldn't cost us anything? You know, I, I, go to the week, I go to the gym a couple times a week with Al, the trainer. I hate it. <laughs> but I know that if I didn't go, I would look like the gospel blimp. <laughs> so I do what's inconvenient because coming up on 73, I think that it might help me to live a little longer. All right. All right. Please hear me. Some of you have never signed up in a life group. You're doing life halfway the way that the pattern was in the early church. So you say, well, then why should I join the life group? Glad you ask. First of all, it's the biblical pattern. It's the biblical pattern. It says, verse 42, now all who believed were together. So when I read that, I'm reading this, and and I'm not trying to be legalistic. Like, we don't call you, if you don't show up on Sunday, you know, well, some of you we might call because you were supposed to serve and you didn't show up. We say, are you okay, right? But if we just come to church on Sunday, we're missing half the biblical pattern. And then some people say, well, I don't want to go. But what if... What if it's, it's not about what you get from that life group, but what if it's what you could pour into others that are in that life group? Man, in the life groups that I've attended, I've had, I've had people that are, I mean, I've been a believer since I've been, you know, five. But in some of the life groups I've been in, I've had people that have just been a believer for a year or two. And sometimes when we talk about life, I have to sit back and think, wow. Man, I I learned something today through this individual because of what they've, you see, everything you've been through makes you who you are. And they'll share things with me and I'll think, oh, that changed my life. That changed my life. So what if you are the person that God wants you to impact somebody else's life in a life group. It's a biblical pattern. Second of all, it's personal. It's personal. You can't can't have a conversation or ask questions in a crowd like this, although some of you do talk the whole time I'm teaching. (laughs) It's hard to get to know others in a row. It's much easier to get to know people in a circle. I was reading this week a study that said, if a person has seven good friends at the end of a year attending a church, they stay at that church. Seven good friends. And you don't have to know everybody to feel like that this is my church. The average person in any size church knows 63 people, or maybe less, but at least 63. So that means if it's a church of 60 or 600,000, you'll probably know about 63 people. 
But you know those 63 people because you've got involved either in serving or in their life and building a bridge to someone. And number three, the reason that we want to join a small group, it's where the needs are met. It's where needs are met. Verse 45 said, they met the needs. They met the needs. And how many, how many of us, we know that in a life group, there's been times you needed a babysitter and somebody in your life group, when you said, I, I need somebody, they showed up. How many of you know that sometimes you needed to somebody drive you to the doctor and somebody in your life group showed up and drove you to the doctor? How many of you have been through hospitalization and different things and who brought meals to you? Your life group, your life group. I remember hearing Rick Warren tell the story once in preaching. He said, he said, we talk about being part of a life group. And he said, there's a guy that attended Saddleback Church for 10 years. He said, I'll tell you where he sat. He sat right up there in the balcony for 10 years. Every Sunday he would come and he would listen to the sermon and he would leave. But he never joined a life group. He never volunteered. He never built a bridge to anyone else. Rick said, I was away on a mission trip and came back. And he said, the guy cornered me out in the lobby after the service. And he said to me this, he said, I've been in the hospital for two weeks and nobody visited me. And Rick said, it's your own fault. You've been attending this church for 10 years. I even know where you sit. And you've never joined a life group. You've never built a bridge to anybody else to be a friend. And you've never once ever served anywhere. And cre- you've never created a vacancy with your life. When I first started the Father's House, I tried to do everything. Hospital visits, counseling, everything. Else. All the funerals, all the weddings. And guess what? I just about wore myself out. Because it's impossible for one man to do all the praying, all the preaching, all the baptizing, all the funerals, all the weddings. Because the Bible says this, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it gives me an assignment, it gives Tim an assignment, Anita, Andrea, and our other pastors. And he gave himself some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Read it out loud with me. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Read that again. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Read it again. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So if our pastors don't equip you to do ministry, we're failures. Failures. So that means if you're sick and and somebody visits you from your life group, guess what? You've been ministered to. You've been ministered to. Well, you are the ministers, and our job is to administer to you. Make sure that you're fed. God never meant to create super pastors. You don't see my name anywhere outside on any sign. You don't see it in the lobby. You don't see a picture of me there with a halo over my head that when you come in, you need to say, super pastor. I don't wear a cape. And wear a mask and come into your hospital room and sprinkle pixie dust. Here a prayer, there a prayer, everywhere a prayer, a prayer. And then fly off into the sunset and then take my mask down and say, it's me, it's me, it's Terry, super pastor. No. I learned a long time ago, this man right here, the old white haired man. does a much better job at counseling than I do, and his team. Those of you that have signed up for freedom groups have been hand-trained. Those freedom groups, those people have been hand-trained, am I right, Pastor Tim? In how to help people through crisis. Hand-trained. They've gone through classes. So I'm telling you, in some of those groups, you sit down with some of them, and they'll do better at counseling you than I could ever do. I remember years ago, Anita says, yeah, that's true. So, look, you, you come to me, and I'm going I'm to listen to you. I'm going to try to be kind, patient. But I'm, gonna, I'm thinking, get to the bottom line. What's the issue? Pastor Tim, he's so patient. Yeah, and how's that? And what's that? And how's that make you feel? And, but me, I want to get to the bottom line. I want to simply say, do this, do this. You'll be all right. See you sometime. Okay. Not Pastor Tim. Not our freedom care. Not our life group leaders. 
they'll stick with you. I told that to someone once years ago. I preached and I said, look, if you see me show up in your hospital room, it's bad news. (laughs) So we had a lady, a, a single mom that was sick and she was in Gainesville of all places in the hospital there. And I just felt like on that morning, the Lord said, I want you to go up and I want you to pray for her. This is the honest truth. I walked in the room and she looked at me and she said, oh God, what do you know that I don't know? Oh <laughs> I said, oh, just be patient. I don't know anything else. I prayed for her, but she died. <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. I didn't mean that. Let's delete that. Okay. (laughs) She got healed by going to heaven. Okay. (laughs) I think I redeemed myself on that one. How about that? 95% of the churches in America are less than 300 people. You know why? Because that's the maximum load that any one man can handle. On any given Sunday here, we'll have adults between five and 700. Plus kids. There's no way I can do all that. There's no way. People say, well, I want the pastor to come and visit me when I'm sick. Well, that's Jesus. He's the good shepherd. I'm not the pastor. But anytime any of our people minister to you. That's the church. That's the church. Number four, the reason I want to join a life group, it helps us practice unselfishness. Helps us practice unselfishness. Romans 5, 15, verse 1 and 2, those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us. You see that? Strength is for service, not status. Each of us needs to look to uh, after the good of the people around us, asking yourself, who can I help? How can I help, brother? Look, I'm naturally self-centered. Don't laugh, you are too. You think more about you, I think more about me, the majority of the time than I think about you. But I do think about you, okay? So when people say, well, you know, I just, no, here here it is. On Mondays, after I've had a long day of my least favorite thing of doing is meetings, the last thing I want to do is to go to my life group on Monday nights. I'd rather go home, turn on the TV, kick up my legs, and watch, I don't know, some football, something. But I don't live by convenience. When it's time to meet with my life group and the leader who leads my life group, I drag myself on my motorcycle or the truck and I go to meet with them because I want to practice being unselfish. But you know what? By the time I leave that group, I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I went. I learned something I couldn't learn anywhere else. But you see, some of us need to get beyond ourselves. Get beyond ourselves. There's all kinds of groups, and we're not saying it's just that you got to you got to do one of these. You can say, "Well, you know, I'd like to lead a group. We golf every week. I'd like to. Could we do a golf group? Sure, you can. Left-handed and basket weaving is a great group. (laughs) Those caffeine people of Starbucks group could make." And Tanya will train you, and all we ask is that you remember ESPN. You remember ESPN and your group. The E stands for when you get together as a group, you do whatever you're going to do, and then you encourage. You encourage one another. We're bringing hope. We're bringing hope and encouraging one another. S stands for scripture. You want to share God's word. You want to bring God's word into it. Somebody says, you know, I'm going through this tough time. And you say, hey, you know what? There's a scripture. There's a scripture about that. And you bring the word in. And then we pee. We pray. <laughs> we pray. P stands for pray. <laughs> Oh, 
I see Pastor Alex back there. Alex, help me out a little bit here, all right? <laughs> P stands for pray. Because we don't want to do, handle this by ourselves. And then N stands for next steps. What's the next step? We say to them, hey, what's, what's the next step, guys? How can we help? How can we help? I lived, uh, I was raised in southern Illinois, and we had a refuge there for geese, Canadian geese, that would fly from the north to the south. And there would be thousands, thousands in that uh, refuge that would fly in. As a kid, I remember, honk, 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 look overhead and see that V formation of those geese flying. I was studying this week, and I, I found out that the geese fly 71% farther when they fly in formation. When one gets out of formation, he gets the flapping his wing and he notices that there's so much air drag he'll get back in formation. The lead uh, goose is creating a draft for all the other ones. And then when he gets tired, he just drops back and another one steps to the front to keep the pace going. The lead goose doesn't honk. It's all the others behind him that does the honking. What they're saying is, keep up the pace. Keep going. Thank you for helping. Keep going. Keep going. I, I think maybe we need some goose sense. And realize we can't make it alone. We need life together on the weekend services. And we need to do life together in small groups. We'll achieve more goals. It'll be more of an uplifting experience. You need a large group on Sunday morning and you need the small groups that will meet throughout the week. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for giving us a pattern for doing life. I thank you, Lord, for giving us the pattern for doing life. Lord, please don't let anybody feel like this was a, just getting in and messing with their life because they've never been in a small group and feel guilty. That's the enemy. You've not given us a spirit of condemnation. So Lord, I just pray today that it's not guilt, but it's just motivation to say, you know what? I'm going to try it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to get in one of these groups this semester. So we don't want to do life alone. We pray for the life group leaders and we pray for those that have already signed up. With every head still bowed and every eye closed, let me just ask you this. Man, I wouldn't want to end the service today without asking you this question. Are you in formation? Are you doing life together with other believers? Maybe you came today and you feel lonely and isolated and all by yourself because you've never invited Jesus in your heart and in your life. That's the first step. God never wanted to spend eternity alone, but he created, he created a world in which that he sent his son Jesus to come and live a sinless life. He died on the cross for your sins and my sins. On the third day, he rose so that anyone who calls upon his name can be saved. So if you came in today and you're not sure of your eternity, you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, would you allow me the privilege today of leading you in prayer and inviting Jesus into your heart, and into your life? Here, here, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to make you feel bad. But if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart or you're unsure about your eternity, you're not sure if you were to leave here today, if you're ready to go with the Lord or not, would you let me pray with you today? Right where you're sitting, would you just raise your hand and say, Terry, include me in this prayer today. Include me in this prayer today. I want to be sure. Thank you. Thank you. Others today that would raise your hand and say, that's me. That's me. I, I, I need to pray that prayer today. I need to pray that prayer. Those of you who are watching online, just lift your hand right where you are. I know that may feel strange in a room by yourself, but the Lord sees you where you are. Others today say, yeah, that's me, Terry. I want to be sure my eternity is settled. I want to be sure of that. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt. Let me lead us in a prayer today. I'll pray for those who raise their hand here and those who raise their hand online. Would you pray this prayer with me? Father God, 
I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life, and to be my Lord and Savior. I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that you are the Lord. And you rose on the third day. As best as I know how, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you celebrate with me today with those who raised their hand? Come on. Listen, here's what we're going to do in just a minute. We're going to stand and sing a little bit more of one of these songs. We're going to go out on a worship note, giving the Lord praise today. But if you raised your hand, I'd like for you, as we get ready to stand up and as we go out, I'd like for you to go back and meet Pastor Tim. He's standing there. He's going to take you out. Here's what he'll do. He'll take you out to the next steps table. He's got a book to give you. He's got some information. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to give you a Bible. And we're going to help you. you. Just pass by there and he's going to help you. And if you haven't signed up for a life group, please stop in the for you and do that. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. Let's, let's worship him with all of our heart because he is worthy of worship. And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Thank you. 